I'm Zach Fazio. I believe that baptism is necessary for salvation, but I understand that not everyone agrees. Today, I wanna to show you how to have a logical and Bible-based discussion about this topic. And please leave a comment, but let's be respectful about it. So this character, let's call him Jack, will represent someone who does not believe that baptism is necessary for salvation. So I'll give some of the best arguments to support this point of view, and Zach will need to defend what he believes. Okay, but before we talk about our differences, we should first establish what both sides can agree on. Otherwise, we're gonna spend this entire conversation talking past each other. We need to agree that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and that if we approach it with humility, we can find the answer to this question. So this conversation should be based on, what does the Bible say? Number two, we need to agree that humans are not automatically saved just because they are human. If that were true, that would mean that all humans are saved already right now. So something is necessary for salvation. Finally, number three, we need to agree on our terms. What does it mean to be saved? Well, there are many differences between someone who is saved and someone who is not. But for this discussion, we need to agree that someone who is saved has their sins forgiven and they have the Holy Spirit. Here's what the Bible says about this. In Ephesians chapter one, the apostle Paul tells Christians that in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. In Titus chapter three, verses four to seven, Paul says, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So if someone has salvation, their sins are forgiven and they have the Holy Spirit. If we can at least agree on these three things, then we have a starting point for the conversation. So where do we disagree? Well, I believe that all you have to do to receive salvation is accept Jesus as your personal savior. This could happen while saying a prayer, or listening to a sermon, or reading the Bible. In that moment, God forgives you of all your sins and you are filled with the Holy Spirit. That's it. Baptism, therefore, is something that Christians do after they've been saved. I believe that baptism is not the moment of salvation. I think of baptism as an outward sign of inward grace. It symbolizes what God has already done in your heart. So Zach, why do you disagree with that? Okay, it sounds like we believe in two very different baptisms. If baptism is just an outward sign of inward grace, then I would agree with you. I believe that baptism is the moment when God and Jesus save us. However, we need to be baptized the right way and for the right reasons. So let me explain. Okay, there are dozens of verses throughout the New Testament that mention baptism or the idea of being baptized. But not every one of these is relevant for this conversation. For example, some talk about the baptism of John the Baptist, but there are several that mention the one true baptism of Jesus. Let's look at five of these. First, let's look at Acts chapter two, verses 36 to 41. At the beginning of the book, Peter is preaching the gospel of Jesus to a crowd of people. He says, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? This is an important question. What should we do in response to the gospel message? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter says that true baptism is done in order to receive the forgiveness of sins and to receive the Holy Spirit. Peter then says, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them 
and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Peter calls this a promise, and this promise is evident throughout the rest of the book of Acts and through the New Testament. In the book of Romans, Paul explains why baptism is so important. He says in chapter 6, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. You see, true baptism is a moment of spiritual transformation. We are saved by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Our old life dies and we are raised to a new life. We are born again. For example, the Apostle Paul tells the story of his own conversion in Acts chapter 22. In verse 16, a Christian told Paul, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. You see, Paul believed that baptism was the moment when he washed his sins away. Peter also talks about the power of baptism in 1 Peter chapter 3. Starting in verse 20, he says, God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice that baptism is not just about getting wet. Baptism is a pledge. As we pledge our lives to Jesus by being baptized in his name, Jesus saves us by the power of his resurrection. Finally, it's important to understand that there is only one true baptism. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. All seven of these things are critically important. For example, you don't want to realize on Judgment Day that you were following a Lord other than the one true Lord Jesus, or that you did not believe in the one true Spirit. Paul says that God is through all and in all these things. But notice the one baptism. Rejecting the one baptism is like rejecting the one true God. The one baptism is not the baptism you are talking about. From the five scriptures I just showed, we can summarize that the one true baptism is the moment when someone pledges their life to Jesus and is saved by God through the power of Jesus' death and resurrection. The person submerges in water spiritually dead in their sin, but raises forgiven of their sin and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't believe baptism is the only thing that is necessary, but I believe that these five scriptures, among many, show why baptism is necessary for salvation. What do you think? Okay, I have some thoughts. Let's look back at Acts chapter 2. As you know, the New Testament was written in Greek. In verse 38, the word in English, for, is translated from the Greek word, ice. But I've heard that ice doesn't necessarily mean for. In the context of this verse, it may be better to translate ice as because of. What if Peter was really saying, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the forgiveness of sins? In that case, what Peter was saying is, since your sins have already been forgiven, 
Now you should go repent and be baptized. What about that? Well, you're misunderstanding that Greek word ice. The NAS Exhaustive Concordance defines ice as to or into, indicating the point reached or entered, or the purpose or result of something. For example, consider a similar phrase in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Shortly before Jesus died, he said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for ice, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus didn't die because our sins were forgiven. He died so that our sins could be forgiven. Look at the different English translations of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The translators clearly do not think ice means because of. As biblical scholar Douglas Jacobi says, the phrase in Acts 2.38 is universally rendered for the forgiveness of sins or so that your sins may be forgiven. Also, it's important to read the full context of this verse. Right after Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So clearly, Peter did not think the crowd already had the Holy Spirit. And finally, in verse 41, it says, those who accepted his message were baptized. The crowd was not confused about what Peter meant. They understood they needed to be baptized in order to be saved. Okay, let's move on and look at 1 Peter chapter 3 again. Doesn't this passage actually say that baptism is just a symbol? Look. The word symbolizes appears right next to the word baptism. So what about that? But baptism is not the symbol in that passage. Look again. Peter mentions that water saved the people on Noah's ark. And this water, the water in Noah's time, symbolizes baptism that now saves you. And then he reiterates his point a few words later. It meaning baptism, saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So baptism is not the symbol in this passage. Actually, it's the opposite. Baptism is the reality. It's the very moment that Jesus saves us by the power of his resurrection. So at this point, you have not refuted any of these five scriptures. So I still believe baptism is necessary for salvation. Okay, but if baptism really is necessary for salvation, then what do you say about these four counterpoints? First, I want to talk about a man commonly known as the thief on the cross. In Luke chapter 23, Jesus is crucified alongside a criminal. When that criminal expresses his faith, Jesus tells him, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So, it's clear that Jesus saved this man, but he did not need to be baptized. So what do you say about that? Well, let's first look back a few chapters earlier to Luke chapter 5, verse 24. Here Jesus says, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So during Jesus' ministry, he did forgive people of their sins. In that chapter, he forgave a paralyzed man. Two chapters later, Jesus forgives a woman, and as you said, in chapter 23, it looks like Jesus also forgave the man on the cross. But all of these events took place during the Old Covenant. People like Moses, David, and Isaiah also did not need to be baptized because they also lived under the Old Covenant. Jesus brought a new covenant when he died and raised from the dead. So now that we live in this new covenant, God calls us to be baptized in the name of Jesus so that we can share in the power of his death and resurrection. So no, that passage does not support your point of view. Okay, but what about the Philippian jailer? In Acts chapter 16, a jailer asks Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved you and your household. This passage seems very clear. All he had to do was believe. Well, you're reading this passage out of context on multiple levels. First, let's look at the immediate context. The passage says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, 
you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. For Paul, true belief includes baptism. For example, in Acts chapter 19, Paul finds some disciples and asks them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? Paul was confused. What do you mean you didn't receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? What baptism did you receive? In one sense, our belief in Jesus is confirmed when we are baptized in his name. Secondly, you need to look at the larger context. Earlier I showed you multiple passages across the New Testament, including the book of Acts, where both Paul and Peter talk about the power of baptism. So this passage also does not support your point of view. Okay, but what about Romans chapter 10, verse 9? Here the Apostle Paul says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So all we have to do is say Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead. That's it. Well, this verse is in the book of Romans. And four chapters earlier, in the same book, in chapter six, Paul talks about baptism. Different Bible passages emphasize the necessity of different things. Belief is necessary, repentance is necessary, baptism is necessary, and confessing Jesus as your Lord is a part of all of this. You can't just pick and choose scriptures, taking them out of context, and ignoring other scriptures in order to prove your point of view. Look at these verses from James chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Having faith in Jesus is like going on a date with someone in order to get to know them. Repentance is like getting engaged to that person. And baptism is like the moment when you marry them on your wedding day. A truly life-changing event. So this passage also does not support your point of view. And you have not been able to explain away the five scriptures that I showed you about baptism. Okay, but isn't baptism a work? In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. There's nothing we could ever do to earn salvation. Well, you're right that there's nothing we can ever do to earn salvation. But consider John chapter 6, verse 28. Here some people asked Jesus, what must we do to do the works God requires? And then Jesus answers, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So even belief itself is a work. The point of Ephesians chapter 2 is that salvation is only possible because of God's grace. There's no amount of good deeds we could ever do to earn it or deserve it. This verse answers the question, why are we saved? But it does not answer the question, when are we saved? We both agree that we need to do something to accept God's salvation. So when we are baptized, we are not earning salvation. Consider what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. You see, when we're baptized, God and Jesus do the real work of salvation. They transform us. If this is true, then what does that say about all the churches that teach something different? And what about my friends and family who don't believe this? Does this mean that I'm living a lie? Well, I think we've reached the inevitable end of this conversation. 
because all of those objections are either based on what other people say or believe or based on your emotions. They're not based on what the Bible says. But I can say this. If someone got baptized for the wrong reason, they can still get baptized the right way. Look back at Acts chapter 19 when Paul asked those disciples, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It was simple. They needed to be humble and get baptized again, this time the right way. And finally, it's important to remember that God is the ultimate judge. He can choose to save anyone, regardless of what they have done or not done. He is a gracious and compassionate God. But do you really want to stand before God on Judgment Day? If you have rejected His plan of salvation, let's be humble and accept what the Bible teaches. So that's the conversation. Let me know in the comments what you liked or didn't like. Please consider going to our website, where you can become a monthly supporter, which will help us to make more videos. And to find out more or connect with a church in your city, go to disciplestoday.org. But for now, that's just some more keys for life.